Hello to the chicas and the chicas. Today on the menu is going to be a game analysis, but it actually is coming from a lesson. And this lesson with my student uh, had a very, very cool moment. And when we went through that part of the game, I just really felt like we managed to find a really, really cool uh, moment in his game that hopefully is going to enable him uh, to improve and overstep a certain obstacle and that point in the uh, lesson I went like oh my god if only I had turned you know record recording on I would be able to publish this on YouTube so now this is a, a second take of uh, the same thing I'm going to show you the game the student is in the black trunks um, he's about 1100 over the board rating um, and um, yeah, the opening actually went really, really nicely for us. And please know that student does tend to play rather passive chess every now and then. And so um, what we did in this opening from here on out, oh, divine stuff, check this out. C6, A5 was already great. C6, great. Knight takes back. Now black is, I think, doing perfectly fine already, if not better. A4 came from the opponent, a very suspicious move, giving up the B4 square. Um, rook E8, good stuff. Um, rook E1, good stuff. And talking about um, playing aggressive chess and playing forward-thinking chess, which is what this whole entire big spiel in this video is going to be about. Here, my student actually played the move that on book... Uh, on paper looks great. If you see it done by an 1100, you even go like, well done, little pat on the back, and yeah, proud of you, man. That's that's how you should play chess. But I couldn't help but correct it. So what he did was he played the very obvious looking rook c8. And this is a great move. Really nothing to, you know, complain about, so to speak, or, or say that this is not great. The problem here is twofold. One, the student is thinking that rook c8 is great because it's developing the rook, but more importantly, now we have got this on. And so this is a little bit of a, a short-sightedness that features a lot of players thinking that they go like, oh, I have that. And they don't really think about, okay, what is my opponent's next move? Ah, bishop b2, which basically forces them to play after knight b4, rook c1, completely denying my threat. And so in hindsight, of course, it would have been far wiser to not to allow that, which essentially forces white to defend our threat by playing the moves they would play anyway, but instead go for bishop b4, immediately pinning the knight, threatening with knight e4, prioritizing um, the minor pieces, because yes, bishop on e7 is has been moved but that's when it properly gets developed and note that here in strong contrast to rook c8 the already planned bishop b2 is at least iffy because it leaves d2 um less protected so now knight e4 carries a far greater oomph because um yeah d2 is now genuinely under threat so they need to consider what to do next so what was a very obvious defensive measure against the seemingly cool rook c8 is quite a bad move actually against bishop b4 anyway moving on we played rook c8 queen b3 bishop b4 great chess e3 knight e4 beautiful put your pieces in the center very good stuff rook d1 and here ladies and gentlemen unfortunately i'm spoiling the video a little bit but um let's try this again so i would like to ask you what candidate moves you would consider here and even pause the video if you would like to in order to gain some time i analyzed this on stream since the lesson so um i had double feedback already from various people i tell you now so if you want to pause, pause now. I will tell you what my thought process was and I actually conveyed it during the lesson too. So if I look at this position with black, I've got three candidate moves, no more. Um, in no particular order, more or less, it would be bishop a6, knight c3 and queen f6. But I actually lied to you when I said no particular order because my favorite of these moves is queen f6 based on the fact that that is the piece that hasn't moved yet and i really am attracted to the idea of adding further pressure onto these two knights knights guarding each other is always a bad business and here again it is a textbook case of why that is always a problematic issue neither of them can move without hanging something so um 
without hanging, well, at least um, this knight can't move because now that hangs as would the d2 knight. The d2 knight could technically move, but there's no way good to go. Anyway, so these are the three candidate moves and uh, and perhaps bishop c3 can be added with the idea of knight b4 piling the pressure up on the queen side. But anything outside of these three, four moves is really random. And this is very typical uh, in lower rated chess that inevitably there comes a point where building the initiative becomes less obvious. And instead of having very few candidate moves, like most very good players always do, very few candidates, and that, that's the reason why they play so effortlessly and their time usage is so different from lower rated players, is because they always have a far smaller pool to pick from. But let's contrast now what was uh, discussed by me, queen f6, bishop a6, and knight c3, with what was played in the game rook e6. I, uh, of course, confronted the student about this move. First, not so much on the tactical side of the business, because, of course, we do see that this is an ugly, because there is a skewer there, and I knew that it was blunted. In fact, I knew it already because before he sent the game to me, or rather when he sent the game to me before the lesson, he already said that he blundered here. But more importantly, I wanted to inquire about what this does. And so the rather vague answer was was that ah you know i wanted to do a rook lift hoping to hopefully one day create a king side attack um and i'm like okay that's 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 a reasonable explanation how do we perceive that this king side attack is going to develop oh well i i, I don't know and i'm like okay so we don't we play a move but we don't have a plan that should already be a tremendous red flag in your own head that you see a move that you want to play and you can't exactly explain to yourself how that particular move is going to fit into any upcoming plans. And when I say a plan, a king side attack is not a plan. A plan is rook h6 followed by queen d7 followed by queen h5, uh, queen f5 followed by queen h5, and then mate. That's a plan. It's a really bad one, and the mate part wasn't true, but that's a plan. That's a sequence of moves that I hope to execute. If you play a move and when you ask yourself, okay, and what's the plan? And you can't back that up with a string of moves, at least two, unless the plan is a one mover, um, you're almost certainly making a very, very bad mistake. And that is the case here too. And of course, the plan that I highlighted with rookie six and then bringing the queen across takes exactly 700 moves. And even then, we don't have any threats. But... That's not what this lesson is was mostly about, although this, I think, was a very fundamental learning. But w the reason why I'm bringing this to your attention is, is because um, here we played bishop a6, which is a huge blunder. Another good example, by the way, why the computer can often be misleading, because, of course, people would think, oh, yeah, of course, because of this. Uh-uh. No, it's because of this. And if d then d5 wins the house because when I take the rook, even the queen will hang. So I can't take this because takes he hangs the queen. Thank you very much. And if I play the perhaps more logical rook takes e4, then multiple moves are going to hurt me after the take. Almost certainly it's going to be 95. I mean, it depends on what I take back on, um, on b4. Actually, it might not even depend at all because I can come in here anyway. And now we just fall apart in the, in the center. And all of our pieces are just all over the shop. It's a really, really awkward picture. Yeah, it's it's no bueno. It's no bueno. But after bishop a, uh, a6, the opponent plays bishop h3. And student tells me I was busted. And I'm like, okay, that's interesting. I'm like, what's, what's the opponent's threat here? Just humor me for a sec. Oh, like the rooks are hanging. I'm like, okay. And that's it. And what's going to happen after? Oh, I'm just down an exchange. I'm like, right, let's have a look at this. So we played knight c3. I'm like, very good. Let's turn on the aggro. Bishop takes e6. Pawn takes e6. Rook e1. And I go again to the student with the question of, so tell me, man, what's going on here? And we go like, well, I'm down an exchange. I've got nothing. I'm losing. 
I'm like, okay, that's interesting. So let me just um, get this straight. Um, which white minor piece was the best on the board in this position? Mm, I don't know. Probably the bishop on g2. Right. Why is that? Oh, it is because the bishop is the most important guardian of all the light squares on the board. Ah, right. Okay. So they just gave up that bishop for a rook that was completely misplaced. Sorry. Um, and that's it, right? Yeah, right. Okay. Now, what is the most common P, uh, sacrificing chess in the lower material investment department where we tend to throw a little bit of timber on the wood in order to create material imbalance in order to also create potential tactical chances, structural changes, uh, just to give a different vibe to the position. Well, that's the exchange sack, right? Every time an exchange sack happens in a, in a game of chess, almost inevitably the trends tend to change. The focus tends to change. The um, who has the in the initiative tends to shift from side to side. So already we have an extreme number of uh, factors pointing to the fact that black might not be worse here at all. And we're thinking about we're dead lost here. That's that's the feeling in ourselves. And of course this is fueled and rightly so by the way to at least or, or on a psychological level certainly rightly so is fueled by the fact that we blundered bishop h3. And here I would like to emphasize that blundered bishop h3 means student did not see it coming. Like that's to some degree that I suppose is at least an overlapping definition of a blunder. Now, even if that move does not do any damage to you, the very fact that you overlooked it impacts your thinking negatively. And this is a huge mental problem that a lot of player can't, players can't step out of, which is that, oh, I blundered an exchange, opposed to, hang on, I overlooked that move, fine, guilty as charged, but does it do anything? And you need to be a little bit cocky and a little bit arrogant to think about chess that way, but I have already spoken many a time that up here, you're more than welcome to, in fact, you should be to some degree arrogant, because the passive defeatist mindset always leads to the worst conclusions in chess. Like here, oh, I blundered, I'm going to lose. And this is where this super interesting, in my opinion, eureka moment happen, uh, happened in the lesson. Because here I left the opponent, uh, sorry, the student in the dark a little bit, not revealing my thoughts about the position. And I'm like, okay, so what do you think is going on here? Oh, we are losing. I'm like, okay. We are losing. So let me then tell you this. I don't see a move for white at all. Do you? What do you mean? He says. I'm like, what is white's plan? How, how are they going to win this game? What is their next move? And this is where, again, we are hitting the nail on the head. Oh, rook c1, of course, says student. Then Pause. I purposely don't say anything. Oh, wait a second. That's not possible because of 92. Never mind. So then I go like, okay, so what is then White's move? Well, I don't know. And at this point, I again took the lead and I'm like, okay, so this is how I see this position. I reckon Black is clearly better. Clearly better. No questions asked. I want to play Queen F6 fold by Rook F8 and then either Bishop E2 or Knight E4. And I'm going after you like mad on the F file. And at the same time, white has nothing to do because if bishop takes, I will take back with the pawn. I could take back with the knight, by the way, but I really like this bind that the pawn knight combo creates, denying this square, this square indirectly. So I will change the color of that because of the uh, fork. That square, that square, and the pawn covers that square. So the rooks are completely stuffed, like two rooks, zero moves. The two knights are guarding each other. Someone may have mentioned this in this video already that that's no bueno. How is black not better here? And I have got rook f8 to follow it up with g5, g4 is on, you name it. And at this point, student goes, yeah, right. So now I see it. And I'm like, okay, so this is where you didn't see it, right? And he goes, yeah, I thought I was losing here. 
So that is where I felt like oh, I managed to grab something that is not physically touchable, like that learning moment there. So like, ah, gotcha, baby. So what do we need to do differently here so that next time we can actually evaluate this correctly? Well, the ultimate lesson that we need to learn, multiple of them, but my main takeaways from this would be one is that you do not evaluate positions primarily on materialistic considerations, especially not when the material discrepancy is an exchange. Because that, once again, can give very weird characters to positions. Because if your rooks are doing as much as these two are, then being an exchange up is not exactly something that you would want to write home about. Second, and this is the most important, which is almost always overlooked by low rated players and by that I mean virtually anybody below 2000 and that is the what is my opponent's next move and what is my opponent's plan question. Once you get into the habit of always incorporating into the evaluation this what is my opponent's next move you are going to be, oh my God, making progress like I can't even describe. Because if you look at this position without moves going through your head, inevitably, the only thing you see is, is like, oh, oh well, I'm an exchange down. I blundered bishop h3. Life sucks. I'm going to lose. That's it. There is no other way to possibly consider this position if you don't have this mentality of, okay, what will Y do to win this? And the longer you look, the more you realize that there is utterly nothing there. Y just there cannot possibly make progress here. And indeed, after Queen F6, the engine's line goes knight E5, knight E5, D5, Queen F8. A super tricky move to find to defend the pawn on B4, or the bishop, I should rather say. And at this point, actually, the position reaches what... Um, computers, no, humans like to call dynamic equilibrium, which is where both pieces, both sides pieces have reached more or less perfect squares, maximum potential, and we can't really hurt each other, and we can't really move our pieces to better squares. So in any other sport, this is the textbook case that they would describe as a stalemate. In chess, we can't do that because we have that term for something altogether different, but you get my gist. Having said that, even now, me knowing that this is dead even, triple zero, dynamic equilibrium, every day of the week I would pick black here to play with. And I can guarantee you that if I play this position against myself, the guy who plays, the myself who plays black would win about six out of ten games. Because we are humans. This is not dynamic equilibrium for humans. It is a mess where white has no plans. That's what that is. And so, yeah, this was a very, very instructive moment. And I hope that you guys appreciate uh, what I'm trying to convey here that do not stop here, man. Like, yeah, okay, drop the next change. Worst things happen in chess. Have a look a little bit deeper. What are the consequences? Open F file, weak king. No obvious plan for white, which of course is the number one argument there. But whichever way you put it, you realize that we can't possibly evaluate a position without clearly envisioning what our opponent is about to do to us. Because once we see that, then we, it's fair and square. Like, yeah, okay, so rook c1, rook c3, can't stop it, we lose. Yeah, that's an example. Not doable because of 92. But then I have something, you know, to consider and then evaluate. As is... The situation remains that white has nothing here. A very instructive position, by the way, in this regard. And black is perfectly fine. And when students saw this position, he thought he was dead lost. When I showed him this position with, uh, sorry, rook e1, queen f6, play the pass, rook f8, he also got convinced after a while that, yeah, bugger, that's insane. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was... The lesson for us for today in the amateur's mind. Um, I would, just as a side note, I would like to mention that the channel has reached 30,000 subscribers. So that's, I suppose, a great news. Um, only 70 more to go to get to the dream 100k. I might make an extra celebratory video about 30k. I don't know. We'll see how we go. But in the meantime, please 
uh, don't forget to leave a comment smash the like button please sub if you haven't done so yet and i'm going to see you in the next video thanks for watching bye